Okay, so can we go to the panelists? Uh, we have Kumar, uh, Nidhi, and Venki. So what you've described is that if the order book is imbalanced in one direction, the price is going to rise. So that's that's a mechanical trading strategy. That if one if you know if someone has figured it out or if the marketplace has figured it out, you've got risk-free returns. You've got so how long do you think that such a a mechanical trading strategy would survive in this fashion and therefore reflect the reality? And that those people who are participating, therefore, when that risk-free strategy is going to result always in profits? Have you ever seen those people who came to the order book, whether eventually at the end of the day, how many of those trades resulted in positive P&L versus negative P&L? Because you know what, the, my biggest question here is that you're implying that there's a way to make money without, you know, that this is a mechanical risk-free trading strategy. Um, yes, it is a mechanical risk-free trading strategy, except that you have to invest in the resources. So you're saying that the, 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 these, this, and, and you feel that theoretically it is possible for a mechanical trading strategy to win in an efficient market where you have innumerable participants trying to compete with each other for such a strategy to survive? Well, it's going to become more and more difficult, but as long as there's a speed differential between people, there's always going to be someone who's faster. Okay, so recently, over the last 10 years, people have in, um, invested more and more into these um, microchips or connections to the exchange, which gives them this faster connection so that they get the competitive edge. Okay, so where does it balance out? Well, if the investment into speed outweighs the profits that they're making from this. So, then so what, where do you money. estimate the profits that they're making? We do you have any, be any um, basis for determining how many of those trades actually resulted in profit? Was it 90% of all these trades that are being attributed to HFT are profitable or is it 51% or 50.1% that are profitable? We haven't looked at that directly, but given the graph of future stock returns, I would expect a very high percentage of those trades actually making money. Okay? But whether they're overall profitable, given that they have other expenses in investment in speed, um, we can't tell that because we don't know how much they've spent on getting this technology. I, I think that that's an assumption that's, that could be challenged. Uh, because especially you know, if you're so you a practitioner's view, you know, we're like all other elements of the market, there's a commoditization of speed and there's a commoditization of every element of it. Well, virtue, and efficient markets simply just don't allow it. Well, Virtue, when they IPO, they released um, in the past five years, I think they lost money on like two trading days. Right, so they've not lost money. So if someone trades a million trades a day and earns on 50.1% of those trades and loses on 49.9%, he still has not lost money, but at least he's survived in the industry. So, I mean, I, I'm just trying to urge, or urge people to get away from the marketing rhetoric of whether it's a virtue going for an IPO or it is a, a, a new exchange trying to find relevance for itself in an IEX, that, you know, to get away from the hype and the rhetoric and look at the reality of the situation. No, uh, so Kumar, if I may just interject. The paper talks about just the order book uh, dynamics mm -hmm. and uh, how it is responding to a higher presence of HFT versus not. I mean, completely on board. So far, I don't think very many papers, and I'm very happy to be updated on this, actually address the question of what have been the returns to HFT trading strategies, because I don't think so far we've seen data sets that support the transparency required for that. So your point is well taken. Uh, the paper does not address the question that you're raising, and it is something that regulators, policymakers, and the general public should be uh, made more aware of. It's just that, as you know, more, more than all of us in this room, there's a high degree of non-transparency on the HFT um, orders as well as profitability. And uh, once we have a shot at capturing some of that, perhaps it will make everyone a lot more comfortable, but we are not in that world yet. And this paper merely looks at the dynamics of the limit order book. So we can only infer what the profits of those strategies can be. Because, of course, it's not like it's one monolithic HFT firm. There are multiple people, most of these guys are trading against, or most of these firms are trading against, all strategies are trading against each other. So th there is no imputation about profits in this paper. It's merely about the dynamics of the limit order book. And I suspect that as we go forward and look at, uh, say, 
three more months out or six months out, does the trend that we are seeing here persist? Is a question that further research will show. Um, I think that's I think that's the limited point. Sure. See the uh, I mean just to follow up on that. See the the historical thing. Like if you look at the New York Stock Exchange specialist days, that's exactly what they also did. They had access to order flow that other people did not have, and they were always front running those orders. Um, so I wrote a paper with Larry Harris uh, almost two decades back, which actually looks at the specialist profits on these short-term order imbalance. So I think the question really now is, uh, at least in the specialist days, you can assume that that order flow was not transparent, that only a few people knew, I mean, only the specialists knew about it. Now it's public information. Um, so the real question is more in terms of the displayed versus undisplayed liquidity. See, what you are seeing is the displayed liquidity, right? So the imbalance in the displayed liquidity, unless there is a systematic reason why that should predict future prices. Because it's easy for you to manipulate because most exchanges allow you quite a bit of iceberg orders. So which means you just practically touch the surface. So the question really then becomes like, is there a way in which we can systematically tease out what's the total liquidity in this market? Uh, and, and look at that, because otherwise, if it's just displayed liquidity, then I'm assuming that, you know, everybody has this information public. Whoever can react to it fast is going to react to it, and eventually the profits will go away. Because, you know, the cost of building the higher speed infrastructure is going to eat into the minimal profits you're going to get. We space back to Kumar. Um, uh, uh, if we can just finish with your comments in response to all the papers, then perhaps, Venki, you have a slideshow. Uh, okay. Okay. Come on, I, I, I just have just like one comment on for Mr. Foley. See, um, do you, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, it, do, you, do you agree with the contention that today markets are at historically low impact costs for for, you know, uh, you know, as measured by impact costs. So historically high liquidity, low impact cost, and market efficiency. And therefore, any, you know, contention that, you know, someone may raise, okay, it should be done in a certain way, there should be a speed bump, there should be randomization. Is it something that should be a top-down approach? Or is it should be like competitive forces that if an exchange believes that there's a value to that in the marketplace, like IEX, let them come out and do it? Or do you think that there is a clear mal-trading going on and that it should be top-down forced by the regulators? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good question. Um, so I'll address the first one. So if the price impacts have, are lower, I think that we have a lot of evidence that since decimalization, um, the introduction of fragmentation, dark pools, that transactions costs are a lot lower. One of the problems we have in that estimation, however, is that we typically estimate on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, and this is not how actual traders, you know, are experiencing things. So if you wanted to ask for the average retail trader who's trading a very small amount, I would definitely say that the costs that they, they incur have come down. But if you're a large institutional trader and you're trying to trade $100 million of BHP and you need to trade that over four days, um, it becomes very difficult for me to estimate the cost of that. And I would say that those traders, so what, what you're balancing then is the actual effective spread that you pay versus the implementation shortfall that inc you incur when somebody cancels those orders ahead of you, or like Amy's finding, trades in the same direction as you, right? They, they can sniff out your trading intention and start trading against you. And so I think the ability of high frequency traders to do that systematically has increased very significantly. Um, if you compare, let's say, a situation like 2008, 2009, at the infancy of high frequency trading to the, the marketplace that we have today, you know, the evidence that we're seeing coming out from, you know, Vincent Van Kervel or Amy's work, a, a large variety of guys are showing that, you know, a, a majority of high frequency traders' profits are not coming from traditional market making like we may have had with the, the specialists. A lot of their profits are coming, you know, you can look at firms like Susquehanna and they have an order to trade ratio of one because they are never make, making a market. They are only taking liquidity. They are using modeling, right? I mean, 
one of the problems I have with finance is that we absorb all these physicists and stuff, right, um, who probably should be helping us to get to space, but they're modeling the high-frequency movements of price, prices at the millisecond level. So I think that that's an open question as to whether the price impacts are still coming down or if they've sort of bottomed out and started to come back up because it's very difficult to get the information from a trader about exactly the entire package that he was trying to work. Even when we get the, you know, I've got some students at the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, and <clears throat> even when we can see, let's say, BlackRock and what BlackRock are trading because they have to report it to the regulator, I still only see what they did trade. I don't see what their intention to trade was. So I don't see how much they didn't trade that they wanted to trade that they were unable to get or where the price moved away from them before they got there. So on, on that point, Sean, I, I, just I, I just want to add, I mean, I used to be a large buy side trader, so I can give you data on what's the implementation shortfall for somebody like Goldman or Bridgewater, uh, the companies that I work with. The implementation shortfall did fall dramatically for all these markets where the electronic trading went up. <laughs> But the problem for a large buy-side trader is that this cost differential is minuscule compared to the risk that I got added on because I need to spread my trades. Because if I have to do, let's say, over one week, I mean, this is one week worth of additional risk I'm taking on my portfolio, which is not yet finished. So I think that magnifies the picture. And, and I don't think the cost is uh, never an issue for us. I mean, it's very, I mean, we all lived HFT, you know, the fact that, you know, this electronic trading reduced our implementation shortfall. It didn't actually see a big impact, uh, at least for large traders, but you could see that it was going down. Um, and it was going down across all asset classes where electronic trading was increasing. But we did worry about the fact that if I want to get out of a position which is right today, let's say 10 days worth of trading, uh, I can't do it. Because and during stress, you know, suddenly the liquidity dries up. So that's what worried most of us. But then isn't that more a fact of life rather than a fact of electronic trading? Because the best large traders use algorithmic trading tools so that they don't tip their hand to the market. If you have to do, you know, a million shares, if you're a smart trader 60 years ago before there was electronic trading versus even now, you have to be shrewd about it. You have to be careful. So there are algorithmic trading tools for them as well. And you no, know, but Kumar, the is problem is not um, the fact that it is electronic, non-electronic. It is a question of whether you get two-sided liquidity or not. When there is a stress, suddenly liquidity dries up in one side. And because everybody is electronic, everybody is pretty much doing the same thing. Yeah, but so there is a crowding out strategy. So, sure, but uh, you know, I, I think I kind of agree with Kumar's point. Over a period of 10 days, there are any kind of shock that could dry up liquidity, and that's a risk that you would have taken anyway. Whether the market is illiquid, or, sorry, HFT, electronic, algorithmic trading, when you spread orders out over a, a multi-day period, something can happen. You can't predict that there's a shock in the system. Sorry, yeah, the, but you know, uh, we're kind of yeah, hijacking sorry. my entire format, carefully thought out so that we can finish in a timely manner. So Kumar, I'm going to assume your comments are done yes. and that you can stand <laughs> in line with the rest of the floor discussions because I know there are people here who want to ask questions and we're kind of hogging the floor. Venki, you've got seven minutes on your discussion. You're not supposed to have come with a prepared presentation. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Sorry. Um, then actually I can skip it. Oh, good. <laughs> Which was being discussed because it was like, a, you know, it's been left in the middle. Uh, my suspicion is that it it's will left, come up later. It, it left in the middle. I mean, so. No, so I'm going to sum it up this way, that uh, uh, there are two parts of the problem. And perhaps I, I do think that it should go into the open floor discussion. Sure. That, uh, Let's do it to the open floor then. Yeah, I, I, just to open. pose the problem, it is that when there is a very large order, in any market, whether you are a flow trading market or a specialist market, specialist market probably you would park it with a specialist, but then the specialist would choose to dribble out the order over a long period of time because any large order is going to have price market impact. Right? So the sensible thing to do is break up the order. And this is irrespective of the market microstructure. The moment you break up an order, you could you face a higher risk that the price will move in that period. And I think that is the problem definition. And the question is, does the world going to algorithmic trading uh, have uh, increased the risk to a very large extent? Key, con con key concluding is. point was, was a point which Sean made, which was that the perception is 
that high frequency trading has drastically reduced, reduced costs, which is true for a casual trader who's just making one trade. But if you are looking at, the, at uh, all the trades which take place, which are value wa volume weighted, uh, say institutional trader, then that is uh, the we don't I, I'm not don't have a clear picture of what that number would be because of the risk which is involved with the breaking up of the orders and everything else. That uh, for large traders, uh, what needs to be calculated is some kind of a realized spread, which takes into account the price at the end versus the price at the intent, intended time of the trade, Agreed. and that is not very different. No, no, I agree. I think that measurement must be done. And our guess is that that risk was there anyway. Venki's point is that the risk has gone up. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so the question, I, my sense is, that my understanding is, is, is that it is yet uncluded, uh, unconcluded, because I think that the research may or may not exist. And that's up to Sean and the rest of us to bring in at the end of this Discussion panel. I think it comes to the second uh, part of Kamal's question, which is... Did I just mention at the end of the discussion panel? Venki? <laughs> Sean, I, I'm sorry, you'll get the first shot at response. I promise. Okay. Um, I'm going to pick on Sean's paper, because uh, that's the only paper I read well. Um, <laughs> sorry about... <laughs> I think I'll definitely get to your paper, Pradeep. And, um, I think the first thing that came to me when I read this paper is that, wow, there is another regulator who jumps the gun without doing research. So I thought only the Indian regulators do that. But, but it's good to know that Canada also does it. But it's very interesting because Canada was my dissertation topic. And this was almost two and a half decades back. Um, so they were always in the forefront of innovation. You know, Whether it is they had two priority rules in two different markets, decimalization, everything. They were the first ones to bring in to the table. Um, so I think the, I, I want to just not go into the details of the paper, which I'll tell, share with you later. I think the big picture here is there are, I mean, these assessments of regulatory interventions need to be done. And I think uh, this is a great paper to push that into the, into the academic uh, literature. Um, and I think what is difficult in this case, and I think it's usually difficult in other cases as well, is there is a lot of different things going on. So trying to tease out the effects of one intervention, keeping other, others constant is very hard. And for example, in this particular case, there were three different things which happened at the same time. One is, of course, the speed bump, which was introduced uh, selectively. Uh, the other one is, of course, you know, you have a price protection rule which was removed, which in my mind is a very huge deal. I mean, think of uh, four markets or five markets in Canada where you could blindly send orders to any place and there is a responsibility for them to route it to the market with the best price. But suddenly you have one market which is plucked out of that mix where you don't guarantee price protection. So then clearly, I mean, as a trader, you would obviously worry about it, uh, sending your orders to that market in the first place uh, because you might get stuck. Uh, then the third one, which is the maker-taker fees, which got inverted, which is again a very interesting model, but again, from a large institutional investor's perspective, it was never a big deal. So I'm always uh, sort of amused when a huge amount of academic work gets done on this because most of those get built into the commission rates that we charge or we, uh, we pay to the brokers. So keeping that, uh, trying to eliminate the other impact, which is the price protection and the maker-taker, uh, and just focusing on the speed bump is a tough challenge, and I think they've done a great job at least trying to tease out the maker-taker by looking at the alternative market which had uh, the maker-taker fees very similar to, these, uh, to this market. Um, so, but keeping the price protection, and I, I just wanted to uh, lay it out that if you look at the two main results of the paper, which is there is a quote fading going on, which as you can see in the chart, there is a huge jump, right? And then there's the other one, which is the externality effect on other markets. So the fact that this market had this rule change translated to the uh, cost going up in other markets. Um, so I want to look at the code fading. So if you just take a market which does not have price protection, so think of price protection, what it does to a limit order trader, right? So the limit order trader is protected of displaying himself or herself first. 
because that's what price protection does to you. It is protecting your option. But if you remove that, I mean, obviously, a person who has put a limit order into the system is going to manage it very aggressively. So when things change elsewhere, I know I'm not going to get filled. I'm not guaranteed a fill. So obviously, I will manage my order. So given that the code fading is a response to that, what you're seeing is I see a liquidity. I post an order. Obviously, the things will be dynamically changed. So I, I'm not sure how much of it is because of the speed bump and how much of it is because of the price protection. So if you do have some evidence from another market which has eliminated price protection, I think you would see pretty much the same kind of response in the limit order book. So I think that's, the, in my mind, a big uh, thing that they need to tease out um, from the from these uh, results. In terms of the externality effect, which actually I think it's a very baffling effect because I was trying to... Uh, sort of struggle to figure out what is driving that. Because if you look at this market where the rule has changed, it's a very small market. I mean, the largest market is TSX, which is having something like 60, 70% market share. And that market share has not changed before and after the event. So pretty much if you look at the order flow, and if you think about institutional investors trying to avoid this new market because of the rule change, Really, why should the cost go up in the other markets? And I can see some part of the skimming argument that Battaglio and all had uh, talked long time back in the US context where, you know, preferencing of orders, of retail orders, skimming them out of the main market would worsen the quality of the primary market. So I think that uh, maybe is happening. But the larger question is for a regulator to see what's going to happen if you let this go out. So institutional investors are not going to trade in this market because it is not part of the smart order routing. There is no guaranteed fill. It's not going to be a big, uh, and it's not a major market to worry about. The small retail investors, as Sean was pointing out, they are the ones who obviously are not making the decision. The decision is made by their brokers to route the orders to this market. And most of them are doing it because they're getting the make a fee, I mean, or the take a fee in this case. So clearly the brokers are doing something which is in their interest and not necessarily in the interest of the retail investors. So if you are a regulator, I would shut it down because either you have this speed bump across the board or you have speed bumps in no markets. So if you're having that sort of endogenously being decided by one market to attract flow seems like a illogical thing because the fiduciary responsibility of the brokers is going to be broken. So clearly, you can have a class action lawsuit following, because I mean, it is possible that this is something that can happen here. Um, so the second thing in terms of the, uh, the cost that I was talking about, the external idea. So once the institutions are out, the uh, retail investors are the only players. Then the question is, what is the right model for a regulator to work in this setup? So is speed bombs necessarily bad? which I think the way Sean was, uh, uh, when he was talking to the Canadian regulator, you know, did what they did was wrong by letting one market do it. And the second thing is by doing it selectively for posting versus uh, taking orders, which I think uh, the HFTs who are the fastest traders who are going to be aggressively managing their book, they are going to benefit. And which is what you're seeing in the fact that they are the ones who are fading the codes. So I think, the takeaway from this paper is that it's a, this is what academics should do to push the regulators to understand the externality effects of their interventions. It is, what we should also do is be able to carefully tease out the effect of the intervention, which I think you're doing a great job, but I think still there's some more work to be done. And the third thing is as a follow-up kit to the regulator, what should you ad advise them? So I think I would take away in this case is that they should say that, look, speed bombs is a, is a way to slow down the trading uh, race to the bottom, which I think makes sense. But doing it in a very, letting the market drive it um, is probably not the way to do it. Maybe the regulator forcing all the markets to do it may have completely different outcomes compared to what you see. I'm sorry, I know you're waiting to jump on this one, but if I may just ask one of these comments, uh, Five minutes, if yeah. you can. Yeah. 
So I have two comments for Professor Yadav, actually. So the for, first one is that, uh, yeah, I think the I'm, paper... I'm glad somebody has read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the first... <laughs> so the first one is uh, that this paper is very, very important because we do not have any paper which actually analyzes how electronification or how institutional uh, trading affects commodity markets. And whenever we speak to our regulators, they're always like, we should not uh, persuade speculators to come into the market, we should always ensure that it is mostly the hedgers and arbitrages. So that way, the finding of this paper is very good. The one question that I have is that you have looked at price uh, efficiency and liquidity, but what about volatility, which has often been their concern that, you know, especially in commodity markets where it's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's uh, very scary if uh, futures market actually lead to volatility. So if that angle can also be added, I think it will make it a complete paper. Plus, uh, even though your data ends in 2007 and it would have been remarkable if we would have had this for 2008, then we would have, could have analyzed how in, around stress periods these institutional investors behave. The, that would have been an added feature. But because we do not have it, can we look at your data from 2006 to 7 and identify extreme price movements around that and see their behavior? So these are the two comments that I have. And for the rest, I have actually a couple of comments for the third paper, which is high frequency trading strategies. So with respect to that, uh, uh, actually coming back to Kumar's point on uh, order imbalance and returns and profitability, maybe it will be just useful to uh, use measures like realized spread and uh, uh, compute it for different trader type and just report that. Similarly for adverse selection, cause you can really capture that measure and just report whether uh, retail investors actually uh, pay higher adverse selection cause vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, because your paper constantly says that it was, uh, HFTs are not being adversely picked or uh, selected, but it is the retail and uh, the institutions who are being picked off. And maybe that can just add, and then you can like defend your uh, finding uh, even better. So that's one. And the second thing uh, is uh, with respect to HFT crowding out uh, other investors. So uh, the way it has been done is that you look at uh, uh, traded volumes of a trader. Uh, as a uh, as a proportion of uh, total orders submitted at the topmost level. Now, my question to you is that uh, if it was unexecuted, if uh, maybe you need to look at uh, whether that order stayed at the top or it came down, right? Order placement matters a lot here, right? It could be that the order was not executed simply because it was not sitting at the top. And if in that case, maybe you should just look at marketable limit orders. So that's what I'm going to uh, say. So the proportion of traded orders to marketable limit orders that are being sent by these. And uh, uh, you, you need to see that. So that's the second point. Uh, for the remaining part, I, I have a lot of clarificatory questions, but that I'll discuss with you later. One uh, other dimension that I thought can be added to your paper is cross-sectional variation. Which So right now you're rep reporting average results across 92 stocks, right? So uh, and I'm sure HFTs, are, for some stocks, you will see a higher share of HFT, and for others, you will not. Then it may be useful to just uh, show that distinction as well, and then this, uh, there, will be, there could be more interesting findings. So yeah, at that, I will end uh, my discussion. Can I add one to Pradeep? Since I am a discussant, I have a right to no. first, right? No? Sh Sean, <laughs> gets, Sean gets first pick, because I promised. Um, and uh, why, uh, then I guess uh, if I can ask Pradeep, uh, but you had no questions apparently. So uh, yeah, Sean, uh, Venki, Pradeep, and Amy get a shot first at responses. And then I'll take questions from the floor. Uh, if you can just stick up your hand if you have a question, I'll, I'll, I'll mark you down. Okay, great. Thanks, Susan. Um, I guess um, thank you very much for your, your comments. Um, uh, we have actually um, encountered this issue of trying to separate out the three uh, items. And, and in fact, uh, I presented this to the TSX group, who are the one who brought in this, uh, this the, uh, speed bump. And they were, they were like, ah, we don't believe your research. We think it's wrong. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's because of the order protection rule, exactly your th thoughts, right? We did so many things at once, there's no way you can possibly tell me that it's a speed bump. 
I said, mm, I'm not sure you really want to run with this line because you're going to make me, you're going to make my paper stronger, which is great. I'm very happy. You are much better than a referee, right? Because you have a lot of skin in the game. So you really push me to make sure that uh, my results are there. So we did some additional analysis, which we have not yet put in here, but we did present when we had at NBER. So one of the things that we did is we said, okay, what you're saying is that you've been removed from the order protection rule. So maybe I have a very good priced order on the speed bump market, and then nobody comes to me anyway. They say, okay, I'm not going to trade in your market place, so I'm just going to trade everywhere else at inferior prices. I said, okay, well, if that's happening, then I can just look for it, right? So let me look at how frequently an order that's sitting on alpha, only three things can happen to it. Either it will be executed, or it will stick around, uh, or it will be cancelled. So I look and I see, okay, let's just see when, when there's a trade anywhere. What happens? And you see this big reduction in around the speed bump uh, event. You see a big reduction in how frequently the order sticks around. Then I look at, let's say that there's all of the liquidity on one of the other three venues has been removed, or all of the liquidity on two of the other three, uh, three venues has been removed, or all of the liquidity on three of the other venues has been removed. In the cases where all of the liquidity is removed from one, two, or three, you get a monotonic increase in how frequently the orders cancel. And that order cancellation is significantly increased once they introduce the, the speed bump. And so what you see is that it's like 0.1% of the time the orders are staying. So that means that they are traded through like almost never. So but that's exactly what you would see, right? So you, I post an order here. Let's say I also post an order in other markets. I get taken off here, then I cancel out here. So which is what you see, right? I mean, is that? Yes, but what you see is a significant increase in the fraction of the time that it happens. So let's say prior to the, um, prior to the introduction of speed bump, if I'm at the best, and they start trading everywhere else, there's like a 70% probability that my order, which was on alpha, gets executed. If you look at the post period, there's like a 98% probability that the order that's on alpha gets cancelled. We'll, we'll talk about it. I think. Uh... <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to come back to was Kumar's suggestion that should we have a top-down regulatory environment or, or bottom-up? And I, I guess that... Um, you know, my view would be that this is something that came in from the, from the market, right? So the view of the traders that I've talked to in the street is that um, payment for order flow in every country except for the US is illegal. So this means you cannot pay to buy that retail order flow. So the under, this is basically synthetic payment for order flow, right? I pay the exchange more to access retail trades without uh, having to experience institutional traders. So um, the idea on the street is that actually the largest uh, retail broker, TD, they, uh, they, they got together with TradeBot. And TradeBot said, I would really like to buy your order flow. And TD said, I would really like to sell you my order flow. But unfortunately, this country, that's illegal. So they said, OK, let's go talk to our good friend, Mr. TSX, see if he can find a solution for us. And this is the solution that they came to. So TradeBot can pay more to the exchange in return for accessing the retail liquidity. So I think we need to be very careful when we let the participants in the market create rules and regulations. I guess my view would be that it's a trade-off between innovation or supporting innovation and uh, creating a level playing field. And so one of the ideas that I'm starting to come up with is uh, something that I, I call adaptive regulation. So, you know, I see this in, my, uh, in the liquor licensing laws in Australia. If you make a new, a new pub or a new bar, they give you one year trial. They say, okay, you're gonna make a bar, we think maybe there is good benefits, maybe there are costs. So we give you a one year license and then we will reevaluate. The, the, you will have to come back to me in one year and apply again. If there's been not too many complaints, not too many disturbances, then we give you two years. Then we give you five years. But it's up to you. The burden of proof is on you. I asked the, the, this, and I think if we did that for securities regulation, you can tread the line, right? Because I asked the, the when this rule was brought in, there was a condition on the rule that said, if there's harm or risk of harm to the Canadian market, then we, we reserve the right to remove it. So I said to the commissioners, is this a harm or risk of harm? It looks like it to me. They said, well, you see, the thing is, it's going to take us litigation and we have to prove the harm. So I think maybe if they did something different, if they said, look, we'll give you a one-year trial, and then if at the end of one year you can prove to us it's not detrimental, then you can keep it for two years, then you can keep it for three years. This would really give the regulation the power it needs to avoid these kind of potentially negative conducts. Maybe to give the regulator, like in India, the freedom to jump the gun and try something new, because who knows, maybe that something new is very beneficial. 
But I think that you need to be careful about, you know, I think there needs to be regulators and maybe one of the things that, you know, Susan might think about is, you know, before we had the specialists and the specialists had obligations. These electronic liquidity providers, they don't have any obligations. If the liquidity dries up, they can disappear. They have no obligation to remain in a two-sided market, in the uh, two-sided quotes, which is what they did have under the that's specialist not, system. That's not actually true. If you're a market maker, you have obligations, right? So there are... Not if you're a high-frequency market maker. Right. No, but if you are a market maker, so you know, a market maker has obligations. If you're a high-frequency liquidity provider. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is true. So, uh, sorry, so Venki, can you, we get your comment? Yeah, yeah. For... Just I, I wanted to get some clarification from uh, Pradeep. Uh, one is this intraday when you're talking about, right? So you're talking about people who close out positions intraday, or you're talking about people who are trading intraday. But I mean, all trades are happening intraday anyway. So the question is, I mean, are you looking at that inventory as well, or? Yeah, we'll uh, all positions which close out the same, which are close out the same day. Most positions close out pretty much the same hour. The, uh, um, it's 92%, 92% positions close out in the, in okay. the hour. So mm -hmm. that comes back to my second question, because the way this classification, because we used to have this problem with the CFT def, CFTC definition, which is they are putting the broker dealers with hedge funds. So for example, we would do, in, if any intraday strategy for us would be a relative value strategy. Right. Um, but most commodity macro funds would take long term. So they will not close out positions intraday. So the only people who would close out intraday are the market makers. Um, I mean, pretty much the guys who are making markets in commodity, uh, in the commodity field. So if you look at what happened during this period, there's a huge ETF. Uh, inflow, right? So that is largely happening where, you know, people are creating ETF securities by buying in. So I cannot imagine that to be an intraday trade where they close out. So I'm, cons I, I don't know what you're picking by this, having two different groups with completely two different strategies coming into the mix in the in that category, CF, I mean, the C2 or whatever it is. Okay, so what, is, what we are capturing is the fact that earlier on what Kumar called market making, uh, market making was, uh, was not really being done by institutional financial traders. Uh, it was uh, being done largely by locals uh, and um, uh, with the offsetting of primary positions by uh, producers and hedgers. Uh, the market making today is being uh, done, and by market making, I mean supply of liquidity. Uh, that is being done entirely, uh, or virtually most of it, by institutional financial traders. So that increased hugely uh, post electronification And uh, that increase, uh, and which about coincided with the time with the with where the um, uh, institutional financial traders entered the longer term market as well now the institutional financial traders who are in the longer term market uh, are potentially different from the institutional financial traders which are in the shorter term market but there are also a huge number of uh, people in common so because this data involves cftc data we actually know the identities of all the players who are involved so a large number of these players are also... My point is slightly different. Mm, okay. See, the thing is, uh, the only new thing that happened in this period is ETF flow. Large ETF flow. Otherwise, it is just like anybody, I mean, the normal commodity market. So the, suddenly there's a, a ETF flow, and I'm assuming the ETF flow is one directional. So anybody who's making markets in that who's not going to do intraday trading quite a bit. ETF flow is not what we capture. ETF flow no, no, is the ETF subject. ETF flow is happening yes. where, the, let's say, if I am Goldman, I would create an ETF, yeah. and then I am trying to get the position done in the markets. Uh, but, so my question is, you have hedge funds who are doing different strategies. You have market makers doing different strategies. You're putting them together as one bucket, and the net result is you have a lot of intraday trading. 
So hedge funds are involved in longer term positions as well as very short term positions. So the, to the extent that they are involved in shorter term positions, they fall into our, bar our bucket. To the extent that they are taking positions longer term, uh, they uh, do not fall part of our bucket. So can I give uh, Amy the last word? Uh, because we are desperately short of time. And uh, see, this is what happens when we run short of time. The floor doesn't get space. I thank Nidhi for her comment. And I think the point about including volatility is a good one. Thank you. Uh, Amy. <laughs> All right. I'll be super quick. Thank you very much for the comments. Uh, first one, your thing on your comment on profitability. Uh, your, you asked for realized spreads there currently being computed. Um, so I'll put those into the paper um, shortly, but again, it doesn't fully address the profitability question, okay? because we, we can't observe their costs. Okay? Um, crowd, your comment on crowding out, I'll have to think a bit more about that. Okay, maybe I'll discuss it with you later. Uh, Cross-sectional variation, we did have this in the paper originally, but we took it out because the results were, it, was, it wasn't that clear cut, okay? but we'll come put it back in. As an appendix. Okay. Well, I, I guess I guess we are out of time. Because... <laughs>